Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Jude Blanchett, and I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies at CSIS. And I'm really glad everyone could, could join us for this really important discussion on a topic that has only grown more and more salient uh, over the past several months, and certainly since uh, January 20th with the, the new administration. And that is cross-strait relations uh, after the 20th Party Congress. And the goal of today's discussion is to hopefully peer around the corner of next year's quinquennial meeting of the Communist Party's uh, Central Committee known as a party Congress, at which point we expect the, the current General Secretary Xi Jinping to take a uh, almost unprecedented third term as the head of the Central Military Commission, General Secretary of the Communist Party, and then likely later in early 2023, take another term as the president of the PRC. And of course that's important because we have seen an escalation in Beijing's pressure campaign on Taiwan that includes, uh, importantly, gray zone, uh, but also uh, recent incursions into Taiwan's airspace, incursions into its ADIZ. Uh, it very much feels like uh, uh, Beijing is operating under a new urgency, and that has led to uh, speculation or analysis, at least, that perhaps Xi Jinping is operating on an escalated timeline for Beijing's long-held goal of reunification. Uh, with Taiwan and uh, questions about whether or not Beijing is still assessing a window for peaceful reunification or whether or not it has changed its playbook. And so the, the, uh, the possibility of an enduring or a long-term Xi administration uh, causes us, I think, to have these sorts of discussions where we attempt to, uh, before this occurs, think through or wade through some of these critical issues of how might a third-term Xi administration um, uh, differ from a second term in terms of its foreign policy? And what specifically does this mean for cross-strait relations? What timelines might uh, China or, or the Xi administration be operating on? Where might we be um, exaggerating the importance of some of those timelines? And most importantly, what is the full spectrum of conditions or factors that Beijing is weighing when it thinks about cross-strait relations? Oftentimes in the current discussion, there's a priority, and, and naturally so, of thinking about just the military dynamics and whether or not Beijing has the capabilities for more aggressive actions vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. Uh, but what I think we'll get into today with our, our excellent panelists is that Beijing may be utilizing a wider set of conditions or inputs as it considers the future of cross-strait relations. So without further ado, and given that we only now have 57 minutes, I'm really thrilled to um, have brought together uh, three friends, uh, colleagues, and really uh, fantastic analysts of this really important issue. Joining us from uh, the countryside of, of Taiwan is Catherine Hill, who's the Greater China Correspondent at the Financial Times, and as I'm sure all viewers know, has been doing absolutely excellent frontline reporting uh, from Taiwan, covering whether this is uh, uh, Chinese military incursions into Taiwan airspace or, or uh, disinformation, uh, Catherine has been covering all of this uh, with, with nuance and aplomb. Next, we have uh, my colleague, Bonnie Lin, who's a senior fellow for Asia Security and the director of the China Power Project um, at CSIS. And finally, comrade Ryan Haas, who's the uh, Michael H. Armacost chair in foreign policy at the Brookings Institution. So. Um, what just as a quick logistics note, there is a, a Q and A button that you can find on uh, the CSIS event page for this. So I would welcome uh, folks as you're watching the event. No need to wait till we get to what I hope is the dedicated 15 or so minutes for Q and A. You can send your questions through at any point, and and I'll be monitoring those. And I know some questions are also going to come come in uh, over email. So welcome uh, participation from everyone uh, watching as well. But to start with, I'm, I'm going to direct my first question to Catherine, 
given that she has the the Sarah Palin like advantage of um, of being closest to the uh, the country of concern. So, Catherine, wanted to ask you. Um, obviously, here in the United States, there's been this really robust discussion and debate uh, about precisely what Beijing's intentions are for Taiwan. And I think the key issue is there's been this raft of of analytical pieces saying that we're really seeing the, the Xi administration uh, pick up the tempo and maybe even escalate its timeline with comments coming out of the uh, outgoing Indo-PACOM commander saying that um, th that there's a uh, possibility that China takes a more unilateral aggressive action vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan within the next six years. I I'm curious, um, given that you're in ta Taiwan and having a uh, 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 closer discussions with folks there. Can you just give us a sense of how Taiwan is looking at this issue of what Xi Jinping's intentions may or may not be and this key issue of this, this timeline of whether this is three, five, or six years? How is this being interpreted in, in Taipei? Well, um, uh, from here, it's actually quite astonishing um, the kind of a disconnect you can see between uh, the reading of the situation or the the, uh, the mood uh, in in Taipei and uh, in um, Washington or what's been coming out of the U.S. more generally. And um, uh, it is true that concern, the level of concern in the administration here, has um, picked up. Uh, but uh, in general, if, if you like reading what's been coming out of DC and then talking to people here on the ground and watching like public opinion, um, there's no way that you could tell that this is a country or a society uh, under a serious uh, military threat or even getting closer to the, um, uh, the uh, threat or the risk of war. There's... The, um, no feeling whatsoever of, or no atmosphere um, like that whatsoever in Taiwan. I think there, there are a couple of reasons for that. One is, of course, that uh, the, the threat from the uh, Chinese Communist Party, the explicit one that uh, they will try to take Taiwan by force if Taiwan does certain things or, or um, refuses to, to look at unification indefinitely. This threat has been there for a very, very long time without anything really, really bad ever happening. So that's in terms of public opinion, uh, people have grown numb and have gotten used to this. Um, and the, the pickup in mil military activity from uh, the Chinese side has not changed that. Um, then in the, uh, I think the second factor is that uh, there is a certain degree of uh, complacency and, and inertia here. Um, the, the Taiwan political system is built uh, such that um, there, there is no real incentive for politicians or, um, to make uh, the real uh, military threat from China uh, a public issue and have a, uh, um, a robust public debate about it. It's, it's, an, um, uh, it's not a popular issue uh, because this is a society that uh, used to live under um, uh, martial law for decades on end. So uh, the military is like traditionally um, unpopular and um, any kind of attempt to impose or to, to um, return a, a larger presence of, of military issues to society is kind of viewed as dangerous and uh, for, for um, in, in terms of elections and popularity ratings by, by politicians. And then I think the, uh, the, the last factor is really uh, within government and the military is the lack of real understanding of what the uh, Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese military are up to and how they really function. I think that uh, Taipei shares that lack of understanding uh, with, with the West. I mean, there, there's a set of assumptions that maybe um, if there were serious um, conflict in the upper reaches of the party in China, that would definitely be bad for Taiwan. That would be risky. So if, if uh, there were internal uh, opposition to Xi Jinping's uh, attempts um, at uh, getting a third term, uh, that would be risky. So th these are the things that the government here, uh, the national security officials, the military officials are uh, really concerned about. Can I ask how um, 
how recent statements from Japan have been have been processed and, and maybe what the contours of discussion or debate are about the role Japan could or should play. You've seen some statements recently, uh, some here made in the United States uh, when, when Japanese officials have been visiting that uh, Japan sees Taiwan or, or a potential invasion by China as a, as a red line in the region and that Japan out of democratic solidarity would need to involve itself in, 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 uh, in a possible uh, military uh, uh, campaign. So how are those statements being interpreted? Is this something that Taipei welcomes um, these more assertive statements by Japan or, or is, there, uh, is there concern about, um, uh, about other countries involving themselves in this? I think um, if you look at the foreign policy establishment in, in Taiwan, uh, of course, um, people welcome any kind of expression of support um, for peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait and, and support for uh, Taiwan as they see it. But um, uh, the people who are really involved um, with uh, bilateral relations like Taiwan-Japan relations and really understand Japan and have, have ties to Japanese uh, uh, politicians, they um, they understand that um, uh, this is not a simple uh, expression of uh, support for Taiwan whatsoever, but th this is actually um, grows out of uh, the reality that uh, uh, that Japan would probably uh, be drawn into any uh, uh, military conflict over time, uh, Taiwan anyway, as a U.S. ally. And uh, with the U.S., with major U.S. forces being based in Japan and, and um, some of the U.S. Uh, assets that would have to be involved uh, in a Taiwan conflict if the U.S. intervened, uh, having to come out of Japan, it's, it is um, obvious that uh, Japan couldn't really stay out of this in any way. So, so uh, those uh, people in, in the military here and in, in um, the presidential office in the National Security Council that, um, who, who uh, deal with Japan, they understand that this is the background um, of uh, the Japanese statements. And, and uh, this of course also happens um, against the backdrop of, of uh, more general uh, discomfort or, or unease um, among democracies over China's, what, China's behavior or, or the, the ways China has been using its military and, and uh, China's foreign policy um, trajectory. So uh, Taiwan has, um, in, in general, I think that this government um, feels that the more uh, uh, like-minded countries and uh, um, democracies uh, feel for themselves the risks and, and the, the, the threats that emanate from China, the, the safer Taiwan might be. I mean, I'm not sure if that's, uh, that's a justified assumption. We can discuss that uh, later, but, but that, that also applies to Japan, of course. I wanted to ask a question that gets to this, um, this line of thinking about how, uh, how Beijing out after the 20th Party Congress may be uh, assessing where it stands vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan. And I think particularly, and again, some of this is pop psychology, but an assessment that um, even though some important trend lines have been working against Beijing's preferred trajectory of Taiwan's own domestic uh, trajectory politically, but also looking at the broader strategic environment. And again, that includes better relations with the United States, statements coming out of Japan, one question I have for you is, is there a, a point at which um, Taiwan becomes a, a victim of its own success? And I think this is something that some of us has been thinking about recently that um, imagine out five or 10 years time and that the, uh, you know, Taiwan's democratic system continues to consolidate and strengthen. Let's imagine, you know, the DPP has another successful uh, uh, round of elections uh, in, in, in uh, 2024. Um, does there come a point at which Beijing uh, believes that it no longer it no longer has time on its side, and that the the, the, the all the the signs are moving in in the opposite direction, and that it no longer can wait this out? I think that's one of the concerns some have in thinking about how Beijing may escalate um, if it comes to assess that look um, disinformation, political warfare. 
are, and, and economic uh, carrots are not working, um, we're losing this. So it, we might need to think of more drastic options. It, do you have any thoughts on that? Or is there any discussion of how success for Taiwan may end up sowing seeds or at least creating preconditions of Beijing taking more drastic actions? I think that that debate is already uh, uh, firmly underway in China and, and has been for some time. I mean, um, and if you go back and try to find um, the first uh, uh, signs of that, it, you should probably go back as far as maybe uh, 2014, the, the uh, sunflower movement in, in uh, Taiwan. I think that's, that's basically... Um, yeah, it could be the moment where it became very clear that the young generation definitely is not on uh, on China's side. I mean, if you have been watching a continuous polling in, in Taiwan uh, 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 many years prior to that, you would see that actually uh, they weren't on, on China's side for, for a very long time uh, prior to that already. But I, th I think there are signs that if, if you look at... Um, the, the scholarly debate in China and then the, the emergence of, of nationalist bloggers and, and um, some like retired uh, military officials in, in China. Um, uh, there's been uh, more and more people um, writing and talking about how um, the window for peaceful uh, unification has closed and that um, uh, some uh, um, use of force will be necessary to achieve unification. I mean, that's that that's a, a line of argument that's been present in the Chinese discourse for years now. And uh, um, I've been talking to uh, Taiwanese uh, policymakers, like people who've been working in the cross straits policy space for many years, and they, uh, um, well, depending on on what party uh, you talk to, but if you talk to um, uh, people from the current ruling party, the DPP, they would argue that uh, Beijing uh, lost um, uh, lost trust or confidence in in the Kuomintang, in the uh, in the Nationalist Party um, uh, after the um, the Sunflower uh, movement because they realized that although uh, Mindjo was um, a, a KMT president was in power at the time. Uh, he, he had uh, somehow failed to uh, well safely deliver uh, Taiwan to uh, to the Communist Party or, or get it closer to agreeing uh, to some kind of Hong Kong model. And so this is already in the past. Um, and and uh, whether um, Taiwan's democracy or even taking a further step forward, the, the DPP's uh, itself may become a victim of its own success. Yes, sure. If, if that debate in, in, in China at some point uh, well, gets to the stage where, where the leadership as well the, of the party agrees that um, uh, it has lost the Taiwanese people and it can't, uh, um, can't succeed anymore and it, it needs uh, to use military force, well, that's that. That's that. But I think um, between... Uh, the, the CCP still having confidence that they can um, win over the Taiwanese people and military force. There is another, um, uh, these two are, are uh, quite far apart. And, and uh, in between is um, what the Global Times once um, uh, uh, described as uh, Lebanizing uh, Taiwan. So I think that, that the whole um, influencing campaign and, and um, disinformation and trying to split Taiwanese society. These are not uh, means of uh, uh, military force, but they're not exactly peaceful either. So th those are like more negative uh, uh, means of uh, trying to, to uh, subvert uh, Taiwan's democracy. And those are tools I think the, uh, the, the uh, Chinese side is looking at and trying to use. Yeah, that's a great point. And actually a very nice segue to, to now turn to my colleague, Bonnie Lynn, because I know this is sort of gray zone is been something that you've been, you've been thinking about. But I wanted to ask, because I know you, you've, been, you've been doing some writing and thinking on this of um, how do we assess uh, 
where Beijing's desire for unification would nest alongside of uh, its other goals and how some of those other goals may uh, influence or constrain uh, possible desires for using military force. And again, take Catherine's point that oftentimes in DC, it's a binary of, of it's either, you know, send in the you know, send in the tanks or not. But of course, uh, there's a whole spectrum of options Beijing has underneath that. But I wonder if I can just get your views on where you see this, this discussion right now on Beijing having, or, or Xi Jinping particularly, having near-term designs to use force to subdue Taiwan and how you think about that in light of China's other objectives and goals and how the two might work against each other or, or maybe reinforce. Thank you very much, Jude. Uh, so let me caveat by saying it's difficult to know for certain how important unification for, with Taiwan is for Beijing, particularly Xi Jinping. But I think we can try to understand how Xi thinks about this by looking at some of his major speeches. So if you look at his most recent speech this July at the CCP's 100 year anniversary, she, meant, she doesn't get to mention Taiwan until the second half of his speech. In fact, prior to mentioning Taiwan, he had listed nine different goals the CCP must achieve, and these include, for example, upholding the leadership of the party, bring about a better life for the Chinese people, modernizing the Chinese military, and pushing forward a community of shared future for mankind. So after these nine goals, she then moves on to discuss the historical mission of resolving the Taiwan question. And here, he doesn't necessarily say that um, the CCP must achieve unification. He says that they need to make progress on peaceful unification and to utterly defeat any attempts toward Taiwan independence. So this ordering if, uh, within this speech is actually quite similar to the ordering in Xi's speech during the 19th Party Congress, where Taiwan appears as the 12th item of 14 different items that she has. So if you look at this, I don't think this necessarily means Unification with Taiwan is necessarily the 10th or the 12th most important goal for Xi or, or, and China at large. But I think that this does show that unification with Taiwan is one of many goals in addition to supporting the CCP, uh, strengthening the party, helping China develop domestically. And it's not clear that Taiwan of these goals is necessarily the most important goal for Beijing. These goals also suggest that um, if you if China does think about using force against Taiwan, that there is a chance that, for example, China's efforts to develop internally or China's efforts to strengthen the party could be jeopardized, particularly if we're talking about a large scale conflict with Taiwan involving the United States and maybe other countries, too, including potentially Japan. So you, so you mentioned, um, what are, so how do we think about sort of Beijing's near term designs to uh, use force against Taiwan? So I think what Xi's most recent speech laid out is China's main goal is for the next couple of years, at least, is to make sure that they make progress on peaceful unification and to prevent independence. It's not to use force to achieve unification. So I think at least from Beijing's end, there's probably limited appetite to proactively use force to invade Taiwan, unless, of course, Beijing views the island as moving toward independence. So in that respect, we can't completely rule out the possibility that China may use force against Taiwan. But one thing I would note is um, Taiwan under President Tsai Ing-wen has had a relatively, uh, I would say relatively stable uh, policy towards the mainland, much more so than some of her predecessors uh, from the DPP. So I think at least until um, 2024, we can assume some form of relative stability in the Taiwan Strait, despite the fact that we're seeing things escalate now, but we're not gonna see major moves, at least from the Taiwan end. So I think at least from China's end up until 2024, until the next Taiwan leader is elected, we probably won't necessarily see a desire from China's end to try to invade uh, Taiwan. I think when we look at um, China's goals for unification, we, we really don't know what China's specific plans are for unification. And this goes back to Catherine's point, right? There are a range of measures that China could take between the large scale invasion and what China is taking now. And um, as Catherine mentioned, there's been a huge debate going on within China. And you've seen a number of these um, discussions, particularly in the last year with different scholars pr uh, uh, proposing, for example, the idea of smart unification, Zhutou maybe using the vaping model for unifying with, uh, with Taiwan. There's also been some discussion about forced unification. Um, to summarize what all of these have is 
uh, varying degrees of Chinese pressure on Taiwan. Uh, and this pressure could, could be in the form of pressuring Taiwan in general, whether that's uh, ramping up military pressure against the island, or it could be very specific targeted pressure against uh, what China views as the Taiwan independent, uh, independent folks or secessionists. This could involve, for example, blacklisting or san sanctioning Taiwan individuals that China views as advocating for independence. So in other words, there, uh, there are a whole host of options that Beijing has short of invasion against Taiwan. Um, uh, as a, as a follow-up to that, you know, Bonnie, one of the, I think one of the driving forces for some of the assessment on a escalated timeline looks at the evolving capabilities of the PLA and, and some are specifically tied to, um, 2027, which of course is the hundredth anniversary of the founding of the PLA and has been set uh, by the PLA as a, as a way station, uh, on its drive for full modernization. So. Um, uh, abstracting a little bit, I think one of the um, one of the lines of analysis has looked at how China's appetite uh, grows as its capabilities grow, which of course is natural for thinking about a rising power. But that means that you know static analysis is often is often short sighted. And so, how do you assess? That yes, they may not have near-term designs, but what 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 do we what happens when we get to the point where the PLA feels like it has a a success a possible successful initial invasion and then occupation strategy and and a way to at least split or blunt possible uh, participation from the U.S. and Japan? Does your analysis uh, change on on what Beijing's um, uh, designs for Taiwan may 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 be? Sure, thank you. Um, so you mentioned 2027. So in terms of the PLA uh, milestones and goals, that's only one of a couple of milestones moving forward. So for 2027, the goal for the PLA is develop, development of mechanization, informat informatization, intelligentization, modernization of the, its military doctrine, organization personnel, as well as weapon equipment, and um, making efforts for efficient use of resources and military civil fusion. But beyond 2027, there are also additional military goals. There's a 2035 one where PLA would, would have likely achieved or hopefully achieved mechanization, implementation, intelligentization. And there's also 2049, which you alluded to, which um, the PLA should attain the status of a world-class military. I think given all these markers for the various PLA dates, I don't necessarily see like 2027 as any more special than say 2035 or 2049 in terms of PLA development. There are just different milestones for the PLA to increase its capability. Um, jumping back, I think when, when uh, for example, she looks at the Taiwan problem, for him, it's not about does China have the capability, the, the pure military capability to um, unify with Taiwan. It's about Xi's larger political and strategic calculus. Would, do, how does uh, baiting Taiwan or unifying with Taiwan fit within all the different goals that she wants to do? I mentioned nine goals that he mentioned recently, right? It, during BCCP's 100 year anniversary. Does unifying with Taiwan by force help she achieve those goals? I think in a lot of these cases, she will, and the Chinese leadership will probably conclude that's not necessarily the case in terms of helping the other goals that China wants to achieve. I also want to note that um, you mentioned um, the static picture versus the dynamic picture. So the, as P the PLA is improving its capabilities, so is Taiwan, so is the United States. We mentioned Japan earlier, Japan is also investing its capabilities. So even if we look at 2027, it's not clear that China would necessarily be able to clearly win a cross strait conflict in 2027 or 2035. I do think some of the discussions about the prospect of China using force um, after 20. Party Congress is driven by some of the discussions of Xi becoming bolder um, after he's consolidated power. I think that's possible that he could become more assertive and be willing to engage in bolder, riskier actions. But if he was to do so, again, there's a lot of different objectives that he has, and it's not clear that he would necessarily take, he would necessarily choose Taiwan to be the one area that he wants to take more risk on. Um, in fact, if you look at Taiwan, uh, beyond 2024, that that's when you have, in 2024, that's when you have the next Taiwan presidential election, right? And as you mentioned, I think as Catherine mentioned, there's a lot of ways that China could try to use uh, gray zone pressure, various forms of influence to influence that election. So I think it doesn't make sense for China to take any moves until way after, until we know the results of 2024, and then maybe even further than that. 
Beijing will probably want to see how things keep on progressing. Um, uh, one final point before I turn it back to you, Jude, is um, I do want to mention from Beijing's perspective, they still see a lot of long-term advantages compared to Taiwan. So they, when they look at the trends, they are looking at what's happening in Taiwan on the ground. For example, the results from the elections, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, polls, um, popular, uh, public opinion, but they're also looking at the very large trend of China's growing military power compared to Taiwan, China's growing economic power compared to Taiwan. Uh, a colleague and I were recently looking, compared to 1990, Taiwan's economy was about 40% of China's economy in 1990, but now Taiwan's economy is only 4.5% of China's economy in 2020. That's a huge difference. When China looks at this, China sees Taiwan as, uh, China sees it inevitable that Taiwan would want to unify with China because of mainland's economic power and the fact that mainland can provide all these benefits to the Taiwanese people. Yeah, great. That's that really uh, great analysis and, and important points. Um, Ryan, I might like to ask you a, a, uh, the same question that I asked Bonnie in terms of um, how you're reading what framework Beijing or, or Xi Jinping um, may be bringing to bear when it contemplates either reunification or non-peaceful reunification. And again, um, Everything seems to be front-loading the, the military capabilities and military goals here. But as I think Bonnie just made a really, uh, I think a really nuanced, careful analysis that, of course, uh, Xi Jinping has more than one goal of, of peaceful unification when he thinks about the country's future. And indeed, he, he himself politically um, has more than, more than one goal. Um, what, is your, you know, what is your sense of, of how Beijing may be contemplating this in a holistic sense? What other inputs might be there and how do those other um, uh, you know, competing goals potentially impact uh, how they're thinking about uh, non-peaceful or peaceful reunification? Well, Jude, first of all, thank you for including me in this discussion. It's it's really uh, wonderful to, to be with you and Bonnie and Catherine. I, I uh, largely agree with, with what has been said previously in the sense that if, if Beijing launched an unprovoked attack on Taiwan tomorrow, it would need to be prepared to mortgage all other national priorities in service of that one goal. Uh, if there were uh, a unprovoked attack, it almost certainly would involve the United States forces, uh, which create difficulty for controlling both the geographic scope of the conflict and also the risk of nuclear escalation. Uh, it would poison China's image in the world. It would lead to uh, other countries in the region to be alerted to uh, China's martial and militaristic instincts uh, in ways that could lead to bandwagon bandwagoning that, that China's strategy thus far has been designed to try to prevent. But it could also uh, lead to capital flight uh, and trade diversion away from China's economy uh, that would have significant effects on, on China's economic competitiveness. Now, even in spite of all these factors, we can't rule out the possibility that, that Beijing could decide nevertheless to proceed. Um, and so it's important for the United States and Taiwan to maintain a credible deterrent and for the United States to remain active and present around Taiwan 365 days a year. Um, but it's also important that we not fall into the trap of viewing the Taiwan question as a binary uh, war versus peace issue. Because as Bonnie was describing, China is working every day uh, to chip away at the psychological confidence of the people of Taiwan in their future. It wants to create a perception that resistance is futile that uh, there will be a fait accompli, that, uh, that eventually the people of Taiwan will, will realize that their only path to security and prosperity runs through Beijing. And that's, that's what we're up against. Uh, Beijing's obviously also investing considerable resources in trying to sow divisions inside Taiwan and to manipulate and influence discourse inside Taiwan. And so I guess the upshot is that I don't see indications of imminent invasion, um, but I can't rule out the risk. But I do see persistent efforts every day uh, by Beijing to work down a continuum toward, toward its eventual goal. And, and the reason I spend so much time dwelling on this is because I would hate for us to become so consumed. Oh, Beijing just pulled the plug on Ryan. Um, uh, I, Bonnie and, and Catherine, I may turn to, we've got some questions coming in. Um, 
one of these is uh, the role that uh, other stakeholders in the region, again, Catherine, you've talked about Japan, but uh, how uh, other stakeholders in the region um, may uh, have an interest in or get involved in. I think one of the specific questions on our uh, thinking about the quad and any role that it, that it could play. You know, Bonnie, maybe I'll direct to you first and thinking about the sort of broader, um, Ryan, I'll come back to you in a, in, in a second. Beijing pulled the plug on you. So we're, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll um, just get through a question that I wanna come back around to the point you were just making. Um, but Bonnie, uh, uh, thoughts about looking across the region outside of Japan, what role do you see other countries playing in um, proactive roles in stabilization of cross-straits relations or uh, assuming things um, you know, went pear-shaped, how other, how other players could get involved? And again, the specific question coming in here is, is thinking about the quad, but would broaden that out to any other, any other countries in the region. Sure, thank you, Jude. Uh, in terms of, well, let's start with the quad countries first. I, we've already talked uh, quite a bit about Japan. Um, I would, uh, I'm on the same page with Cash in the sense that uh, Japan is probably the big of our of the U.S. allies and partners in the region. Japan is probably the most likely country to come to Taiwan's defense, uh, working with the United States. Beyond Japan, I would put Australia as probably. Um, uh, cl not quite as close as to Japan in terms of willingness right now, but I think there's, we're, we're having more discussions with Australia and Australia in the past uh, year or two has recognized that um, developments in Taiwan is becoming more and more of a concern for the Australians as well as their government. Um, beyond uh, Japan and Australia, I think there's still a lot of um, uncertainty with, from the region at large on how different countries might respond. Uh, so, for example, despite the fact that South Korea has a alliance with us, uh, similar uh, with the Philippines and, Tha and Thailand, I think unless we see the specific scenario, um, it's probably it would be difficult for us to say in advance that we would necessarily get support from even our, those allies, our allies in, in, in terms of defending Taiwan. Uh, in terms of the quad, we, uh, we had not talked about India yet, but I think India has traditionally been a bit more careful when it comes to Taiwan. Though in the last year or so, there is some, there are more voices in India saying that um, China, you know, plays the Tibet card, not India. So India should play the Taiwan card on uh, on China. But I don't think those voices are necessarily getting. Uh, at least right now, support, high level support from New Delhi. But I think there are, you know, there are these considerations right now um, starting to occur in India. Ryan, I'll swing back to you for, for a second. I, you were just, you were making a point about transcending kind of mere binaries and thinking about a range of possibilities or, or tools that Beijing has. I don't know if you had, if you wanted to finish up that point and then I, I had a, a, another question I wanted to direct towards you. Well, thank you, Judah. I'm sorry I cut out there for a second. I, the only point I was trying to close with is that uh, I would hate for us to become so fixated on the, the invasion scenario that we lose sight of what's happening day to day, uh, what Bonnie has described so eloquently. Because the, the fact of the matter is, is that Beijing isn't uh, viewing this as a light switch, it's viewing it as a continuum. And uh, if we look at the past eight years, it's pretty clear that, uh, that Xi Jinping has tried to use periods when the KMT was in power to pull Taiwan closer periods when the DPP is in power to shrink the Overton window or the policy decision space that Taiwan faces, to seed a narrative about uh, uh, the future of Taiwan resting with China, to build military capabilities to try to delay or deny or deter the United States from intervening in a cross-strait conflict, and to develop these tools uh, to manipulate uh, public opinion inside Taiwan. So the story isn't in the future, the story's right now. And, uh, and uh, that's where I would like to see us uh, really focusing a lot of our attention. Um, of course, Ryan, your point you just made uh, contradicts the framing of this uh, event, which is on uh, uh, cross-state relations after the 20th Party Congress, but your, your point is well taken. Uh, if I can have you set aside that eminently reasonable point and then, and then point the discussion into a speculative terrain in the future, um, I wanted to get your assessment. Bonnie just made the Bonnie made the point um, uh, previously on thinking about how uh, Chinese foreign policies um, or, or Xi's risk appetite may shift in the future. I wanted to get your own assessment of this. You've been watching 
Um, you've been watching sort of senior pol politicians, senior officials in Beijing throughout the Xi administration, and of course, prior to that. Um, this is again, a little bit of pop psychology, but we are where we are. Imagine Xi Jinping takes a third term. That in and of itself would signify uh, uh, an increasingly unconstrained leader. Uh, as I posed it in, when I sent the kind of read ahead questions for you, it was an idea of, is this a kind of late era Mao who is so unconstrained um, by domestic politics or other elite that he's able to take riskier gambits that, that uh, work in the favor of world peace, like inviting Henry Kissinger on a secret trip and then, and then Nixon, or do we see possibly a more uh, risk tolerant, aggressive leader who, because again, they're unconstrained by, by other elites is able to take some bolder actions that threaten regional stability. I'm not trying to force a binary on you of late or early period Mao, but nonetheless, what, what is your assessment of, of how she may differ after 2022? Well, I'm going to put my think tank membership at risk by acknowledging that I just simply don't know uh, the answer to this question. And in fact, uh, everyone I've spoken to inside and outside of government, I'm not, I haven't encountered anyone that I have confidence does know uh, the answer to this question. But but for the sake of our, our conversation, I, I would just sort of draw back on uh, when we were in Beijing. I, I was in Beijing in 2012 uh, working in the embassy. And one of the things that I heard constantly from uh, counterparts that I would meet with is uh, that Xi Jinping uh, knows where he wants to take China's foreign policy, that uh, the days of hide and bide or Tao Guangyang Hui are, are numbered and that uh, China will become more assertive. And secondly, that Xi knows what he wants to do on Taiwan. He has his own policy compass, he keeps his own counsel and he has confidence in his judgments on Taiwan. And if we, if we look back at, at the past eight years, I think that we can uh, begin to understand what that means. Um, and I haven't seen indications in, in recent months that, uh, that she has felt any need or compunction to throw away the policy compass, compass that he seems to have so much confidence in. Um, but to, to your point, and uh, you know, in, in the spirit of trying to be speculative, I, I do think that, uh, that she will have greater leeway uh, as he continues to consolidate power to ratchet up pressure further on Taiwan I'm not persuaded that uh, any decision on unprovoked attack of Taiwan would be left to him alone to make. But I know that you also spend a lot of time thinking about these issues and welcome your corrections to any of that. Well, Ryan, I've long since turned in my think tank membership card because I agree, I, I, I haven't the foggiest idea on this. And I think um, I, I think your, your analysis is, is right that um, I don't think Xi Jinping has been making decisions on foreign policy as a largely constrained leader over the past few years. So I think we're seeing what the, what the Xi foreign policy playbook looks like right now. And I don't imagine it would shift markedly, um, uh, it would shift markedly on his own endogenous terms over the next few years. I think the big factor that will likely shape risk tolerance will be exogenous factors. And that could be uh, success and strength of, of Taiwan's you know, partnership with, with the United States over time or, or other regional dynamics or instability. Some of these could be black swan events like a succession crisis in North Korea, which could suddenly you know, provoke a dramatically different terrain for, uh, for Xi Jinping's foreign policy. Um, Catherine, I want to, we've got some great questions coming in. I wanted to direct one to you. And I, I'd seen you just had done a piece on, on TSMC um, one of the questions here is, and again, I've heard this as a component of, of China's playbook. I, I have my own opinions, but want to be neutral on it for now, which is um, how Taiwan's semiconductor supply chain might affect uh, China's calculations here. The, the more fever to these scenarios is that China is going to send in you know, special forces to, to, uh, to occupy uh, uh, TSMC. But nonetheless, I take the point underlying the question, which is this is technology and technology supply chains, given how critical these are to thinking about military modernization, are factoring into how governments are contemplating, you know, the geopolitical, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, the geopolitical uh, situation. So how do you, you know, how do you think about the role of, of semiconductors in, in China's strategy here? Does that just lend itself to more kind of gray zone tactics and pressure or, or might the 
necessity of, of uh, you know, semiconductor dominance push China to take more aggressive actions? Well, it's a great question and one, one that I get asked a lot. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, if we assume that uh, the people, the leaders in, in China who, who would um, plan a military campaign or, or um, who decide on Taiwan policy, that uh, they're um, acting and thinking rationally, then you would have to assume that uh, they would not, uh, well, um, kill the goose that lays the, the golden eggs because that's what, what uh, uh, Taiwan's semiconductor talent pool has been for China uh, for many years now. If um, I mean, there have been, has been an, an, a long, long string of cases where uh, uh, Chinese companies have poached um, uh, a key uh, Taiwanese um, semiconductor manufacturing process technology talent from from Taiwan, this continues. And, and um, if we look at uh, how um, uh, China's semiconductor industry continues to struggle uh, to achieve um, their, uh, well, autonomy and self-sufficiency when it comes to advanced uh, production. I mean, they, they've become very good at design, but, but they still, uh, they've still not, not managed to catch up in, in production. I mean, the gap basically with TSMC hasn't narrowed much. Um, so if, if you look at that, what's the upside of, of um, intervening militarily? And, and uh, I mean, anybody in their right mind uh, needs to understand that um, a, an occupation of Taiwan would be a very, very bloody affair. Um, but of course, as Ryan mentioned, uh, we do not understand enough about how uh, policy is, is uh, decided upon in, in the uh, leadership echelons of, of the Chinese Communist Party. So we don't know whether um, the, the military and political leadership in China actually realizes that, how bloody an affair it would be. But I, I think um, assuming that they can just uh, basically land on some beach and then uh, that's it, and then they have control over the semiconductor supply chain here, would be very very naive. So I, I think uh, if if you um, imagine a war scenario, that would probably mean that a lot of the uh, semiconductor industry here, manufacturing capacity might be destroyed. And um, so access to uh, certain talent may be worse than the situation we have now for for the Chinese. So, um, but. On the other hand, of course, uh, technology and, and semiconductor technology in particular uh, plays a huge role in uh, geopolitics now. And um, China clearly is in, in a competition with the US for uh, Taiwan's um, semiconductor prowess. And, and both sides basically uh, try to um, convince TSMC to invest more in either the US or, or, or China. And um, so that's what's what's going on with regard to, to advanced semiconductor production capacity uh, uh, right now. But on the, uh, on, the, um, on the linkage between war and semiconductors, I really don't think that uh, it makes any sense to imagine um, an invasion as a way of gaining control of mm. the supply chain. Uh, Bonnie, and, and a question for you, and then Brian, if, if would like to get your two cents on it as well. You know, Bonnie, you mentioned that in the July 1st speech, Xi Jinping used that phrase of progress towards peaceful reunification um, uh, of the motherland. Um, a question came in about another comment that Xi Jinping made, and I wanted to know how you interpret this. This is the famous comment he said that we can't, we can't, can't pass down this issue to future generations. Um, how do you interpret that? Um, obviously, one of the things we don't do well here in terms of analysis is understanding, um, interpret interpreting comments by Chinese leaders given their context and their audience, which of course we do in any speech by a US politician. Um, you know, stump speech is different from a State of the Union speech is, is different from a televised address. But nonetheless, um, how do you interpret that statement by Xi Jinping? And I wonder if you could put some kind of operational bones on it. Was that just a was that just a, a stump speech, um, or is that an actual strategic? Um, uh, is that actually a strategic comment he is making that has a, 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 that that will be operationalized? 
Thank you, Jude. Um, I can offer my two cents on this, but again, I'm not exactly sure if this is exactly how Beijing thinks about it. So I think um, the way that Beijing is operationalizing what, what she mentioned is, um, I think previously uh, the overall approach from China was for um, to try to achieve peaceful unification through trying to attract um, uh, quite a bit of, uh, trying to win the hearts and the minds of the Taiwan people, trying to use uh, China's economic appeal and whatnot. I think now uh, what we're seeing more and more in Xi's speech is a clear a message that, you know, we need to make some progress on peaceful unification um, now, not necessarily like, you know, wait 20 or 10, 30 years down the road, but make some progress on peaceful unification. But at the same time, we need to clearly prevent any further moves toward independence. So I think in terms of how she might operationalize this is if we're looking at, for example, the next five or 10 years, I could see um, uh, she, for example, still continuing to um, push for what he's already been pushing on the last couple of years, experimental sites uh, with Kim Min and Matsu, right? Uh, asking Fujian to take, a, to take a lot more action to try to test out sides of what could be a model of if if certain parts of Taiwan were to integrate with China, this would be like a free trade area uh, that you know all of Taiwan would be able to um, experience, not just, for example, um, Kim and Amatsu. Granted, you know, Taipei has a say in this, and Taipei has been saying uh, we we don't like this idea, but that's one option of she one way that she has been trying to operationalize is make uh, making progress in trying to achieve um, peaceful unification. On the other hand, I could see as uh, Beijing is trying to put that more pressure against uh, those who they view as advocating for independence from Taiwan, harsher measures from Beijing's end, sort of like what Beijing has done uh, with Hong Kong, but maybe some variant of that of sanctioning uh, potentially Taiwan leaders or pro-democracy activists to basically put a lot more pressure on these particular individuals or maybe uh, even larger groups of people to, in order to showcase to the larger Taiwan society that if you take these actions, there will be punishment for you. So in that way, I'm, I see um, Xi's statement of, you know, we can't leave this problem for future generations as meaning that he will, he during his tenure will try to take some concrete steps. But again, going back to our question of, does that mean invasion? I don't necessarily think that means invasion. There's a lot of different actions that she could take to move the unification progress forward, as well as to, um, try to fend off attempts for Taiwan independence. Ryan, did you have any, any thoughts on that? Well, uh, I, I broadly agree with Bonnie. I think that uh, in the main, China would prefer to win without fighting. In, in other words, achieve unification without uh, the need for conflict uh, for the reasons that we've spent the past 50 minutes discussing. I think their near-term priority is to deter independence or permanent separation and their longer-term priority is to try to compel unification. Um, on, on the specific question that you asked, Jude, I can't imagine any Taiwan or any Chinese leader saying, oh, let's just put Taiwan off for a few generations and then come back and dust it off. I mean, the, the opposite is sort of unrealistic. Uh, it's, it's natural and normal for Chinese leaders to express urgency. It supports their strategy and policy as it relates to Taiwan. And it also keeps them ahead of public opinion inside China on the issue. And so, um, Look, the, the reality is uh, 2049, um, maybe Xi Jinping will still be around, probably not. Uh, Mao Zedong made a lot of promises that, uh, that didn't survive beyond his, uh, his passing either. So let's, uh, let's wait and see. I, I don't rule out uh, any risk or any possibilities, but uh, I'm not losing sleep over his statements that, uh, that it can't be passed down to future generations because it's sort of par for the course. I'd also just note to round out the picture that uh, in the latest five-year plan, uh, they talked about peaceful development of cross-strait relations, which is a phrase that harkens back to the Who era. Yeah, I should say though, by the way, Ryan, there is one, there is one Chinese leader who said we can pass this down and said we can wait a hundred years and that was Mao Zedong. So, uh, but I think you need to get to Mao's level of, uh, of, of strategic foresight and or power within the system before you can make uh, those sorts of statements. We, we only have a few minutes left. So maybe to turn to a, a prognostic um, uh, portion here, maybe just get folks comments. I mean, I'm, I'm hearing from all three of you a very similar um, analysis of uh, Beijing's um, 
you know, near term strategic designs for Taiwan. And I think all three of you are saying pretty clearly that it's in the gray zone disinformation uh, space that that Beijing is is uh, pushing forward very aggressively now. And so maybe with that in mind, just a few comments. And this is actually a question that just just came in over the chat, which is, um, you know, within you know, within the confines or within at least the, the current U.S. policy of, of you know, one China policy, what can the United States do? And I would broaden that to say, what, what can other countries do to help expand, uh, you know, Taiwan's international involvement? And I think also importantly on this, um, what defense, what defenses can, can Taiwan assume and start building to, uh, Better protect itself in the face of uh, of, of these of gray zone and also, you know, more aggressive disinformation, political warfare uh, that is being uh, that is being brought to bear today. So international space, um, and then specifically, what what can Taiwan be doing for you know look, looking forward to be protecting itself against the very present challenge that it faces today. And I'll go in the order that we started. So maybe Catherine, I'll start with you, then go to Bonnie, then go to Ryan to end things off. Right. Uh, so international space, I think um, it would be very useful if um, the like-minded countries and then like leading Western countries uh, um, became smarter in the way they uh, they try to uh, help Taiwan, especially um, some of the, the problematic, most problematic areas have been international organizations and anything linked to the UN system. And um, the, the uh, crux of the matter here is uh, that China has, has um, made great inroads in growing its influence and, and um, has built ties with a large number of countries, for example, in Africa and, and uh, any organization that functions uh, like by consensus or by, by majority vote, whatever, it's, it's easy for Beijing to mobilize like, voting blocks and, and uh, these countries. So even if you have um, a large number of, of countries speaking up for Taiwan's participation in the uh, World Health Assembly, uh, nothing will come of it as long as uh, China retains that um, that huge influence in these organizations. So that's a broader problem that that uh, like-minded countries would probably have to tackle. So the U.S., for example, will have to um, really address its policy towards Africa in, in parts of Latin America and the Caribbean and so on. So that these are issues beyond Taiwan, but that have a bearing on, on Taiwan. Taiwan itself, of course, will probably, I, I think Taiwan needs uh, massive reforms of its um, bureaucracy and of its political system. And I don't really know how, but to, to improve the quality of the political system, to enable it to, to tackle the real issues and um, to, well, face the threat and, and uh, have a public debate about um, what military reforms are necessary and, and have politicians no longer shy away from these uh, issues. So, so um, a lot of uh, heavy duty stuff on, on the table, unfortunately. Yeah, good, good point. I was thinking, as you were saying, systematic reform of the political system, of course, you could say that about a lot of democracies over on our, our deck of the woods as well. Um, uh, Bonnie Lynn, uh, thoughts or comments? Sure, I'll offer two brief ones. One is I think um, in many ways, Taiwan can learn from uh, the experience of Europe because a lot of European countries have been the target of Russian disinformation, Russian gray zone pressure and for, for many years. So in many ways, if our European partners can partner with Taiwan more, there could be a lot of great exchange information as well as um, best practices to deal with the range of gray zone threats. That, um, that Russia has uh, for Europe and then China has for Taiwan. On the uh, security side, I would say that um, one thing we could work with Japan on is considering revising the US-Japan defense guidelines to be a little bit more explicit about how Taiwan fits in there. And I think if we can make progress on those two fronts, it could be quite tremendous in helping Taiwan deal with the range of threats, great zone threats from China, but also a, the, the, a very pressing uh, major military threat from China. Great, thank you, Ryan. Final word. 
So I know our time's limited, so I'll be very brief, but I, I think the Biden administration deserves credit for embedding Taiwan as an issue of international concern. We see this with statements with Suga, with Moon, first ever mention of Taiwan in a G7 leader statement uh, recently. So that, that's important because it, it reduces Taiwan as an annex of US-China competition and, and makes it an issue of global concern. Uh, but if, if uh, I were king for the day, um, what, what I would love to see happen is uh, greater efforts to integrate Taiwan into international efforts, things around democratic resilience, around supply chain security, some of these other issues that affect many countries simultaneously, and Taiwan has a lot to contribute to. But I, I also would love to see uh, joint efforts to negotiate with Taiwan uh, bilateral investment treaties or, or free trade agreements to embed Taiwan further into the regional and global economy. Great. Well, thank you uh, very much to, to Bonnie, Catherine, and Ryan. Thanks to everyone who joined and really appreciate all the, the really great questions uh, that came. And obviously, this is a topic of uh, just based on the number of great questions, this is a topic that a lot of folks are, uh, are, are, are following very closely. And of course, for me, I'll be looking to future work by Catherine, Bonnie, and Ryan to, to make sense of all of this. So thank you everyone for your time. Uh, I really appreciate it and have a really wonderful Tuesday. And in Catherine's case, have a really wonderful uh, Tuesday night. Thank you.